So, um, I, I've intentionally left Rydberg's uh, formula up here because, like I said, this is really kind of the basis for what Bohr made his interpretation. And this is where, um, I, I think this is a, a really helpful point to see where kind of the mathematics ends and where the physics begins. Because everything we've done up to now is taking, you know, you can, you can extremely dryly interpret it as, I hand you a set of numbers, you hand me a formula. And that's nothing but just pure mathematics. Now, I mean, there's more to it, because clearly to get that set of numbers, you had to do some physics experiments. But um, everything up to now has been strictly just the mathematical, um, the mathematical analysis of, of experimental results. And the physics comes in when you take that mathematical analysis and explain why that happens. And that's exactly what Bohr did here. Um, and, and the punchline is that actually he's, he's wrong on everything, um, at least when you peer down into it, that his explanation of, of, of why quantum physics works is actually fundamentally incorrect. But at least his, his way of mathematically, you know, um, what, mathematically associating this formula with the hydrogen atom is dead on. So uh, given that, what we're going to do here is we're going to take a look at this, this equation for inverse wavelengths. And again, it seems a little bit weird that we would make a, a series of inverse calculations, but let's just roll with it here. So, recall, and this is based on the photoelectric effect, for light, we know that if you have a single photon of light, which at this point we can reasonably assume that that hydrogen lamp is spitting out photon after photon, we know that the energy of each photon can be calculated by some weird arbitrary constant, which we now understand to be Planck's constant, 6.602 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds, I think, times the frequency. And recall the frequency of light. If you view light as a as a you know a classical version of light that has waves and crests that travels forward at some velocity and I'll use the word c that if each of these is spaced one wavelength apart and if the whole pattern moves at a rate of c forwards that if you imagine that you're just like a little buoy on a you know on a on a lake and you just keep going up and down every time the wave passes in 1 second the, the number of up and down vibrations is going to exactly equal the wave the length of the wavelength. Am I getting this right? No. I'm going to write, I, I know it mathematically. <laughs> um, the, 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 the number of times you go up and down is what we call the frequency. And clearly, the shorter the wavelength, the more times you go up and down at the same speed. If you increase the wavelength, and, and make the whole pattern go forward, you go up and down fewer times per second. So the, the, the relationship here is the, if you take um, the wavelength times the frequency, that will always give you the wave speed. And that's true for, this is true for any wave mechanics. Um, for light, the answer on the right hand side is C, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Um, for water waves, you just replace that value with some other lower value of speed. But it will always be the case that these two things are inverse to one another. So you can simply just rearrange that. Lanny, what are you doing, buddy? <laughs> Lanny, you can't help me here, guys. <laughs> um, I'm going to get Lenny's bed so he doesn't bother me the whole rest of the lecture. <laughs> Len, Len, you're not going outside. You can lie right here, but good job. <laughs> okay, um, so you can just simply rearrange that to show that nu is the same thing as c over lambda. And that's what we're going to do at this point here. We're going to replace nu with c over lambda. Um, and for whatever reason, I've always thought it's a lot easier to work in terms of wavelengths rather than frequencies. Uh, radio astronomers would tend to disagree. But I am not one of them, fortunately. So we get E. Radio astronomers are a weird breed, by the way. <laughs> kind of like goalies in hockey. Um, but E equals HC over lambda. And 
look over here, look over here. We know that hydrogen has a series of wavelengths which can be predicted if we take one over lambda, set it equal to that. Over here, we see that the energy of those wavelengths can be found just by taking this exact formula and throwing a hc in front of it. So we now naturally have a way not just to predict the wavelengths that will be emitted, but actually the energies of each of those wavelengths that we've already calculated. And I'm going to use this notation specifically with the ni and the nf, which I think makes a lot more sense now. And I'm just going to replace 1 over lambda with this. So this ends up looking like E equals um, H C R naught 1 over NF squared minus 1 over NI squared. And again, we'll just make the, we'll establish the fact that Ni must be greater than Nf. And I will add one more thing here. This is E sub I to F. And this is a fundamentally like groundbreaking equation here because we now have values for for any if you choose any ni uh if you choose any nf choose any other value ni any integer ni above that you can now calculate a very distinct energy and this and, and to recall this energy or this predicted energy is specifically the energy that a hydrogen atom gives off but here's where the beauty of this comes in. If hydrogen gives off some amount of energy, it must, it, the, the atom itself must also change by that exact amount of energy. So if you give off five joules of energy, your energy now is five joules lower. And, you know, seemingly this, like, that idea isn't too groundbreaking. Like, you know, I can always, you know, throw a baseball and, and the act of throwing it all lose however many joules, that baseball will gain that many joules. That's not, that's not a weird thing until I tell you that I can only throw that baseball with one joule or 3.5 joules or 5.9 joules, that there is no way for me to throw that baseball anything in between. But that's precisely what this equation tells us, that the energy that the hydrogen atom gives off comes in discrete units, in specific units, nothing in between. And if the, if the hydrogen can only give off that uh, units of energy by those multiples, for example, that means that the energy of the hydrogen atom itself can only shift by certain amounts. It can't just arbitrarily give off a little bit of energy. It has to give off very precise amounts of energy, and it itself has specific energies that it can start and end at, but you can't just randomly choose an energy and think, hey, hydrogen can give that off. This is where quantum mechanics really starts to become quantum. And, and the word quantum refers to specifically discrete, individual, predictable quantities based on integers, specifically. And that's exactly where this comes up. Uh, I don't know if I've explained that, that clearly enough, but the whole idea is that the energy of a hydrogen atom is not arbitrary. The energy of a hydrogen atom is very well defined, very well preset, and it's like it, it's someone has just chosen an arbitrary set of energies that the hydrogen atom can gain or lose, but nothing in between. And the question is why? Uh, so let me erase this. I'm going to put a, a few words here on the board. Oh, um, and this HCR naught is actually a super important thing, and I had calculated that previously. Um, let me recalculate that here. Mm. I'm not positive this is right. This is this is going to be a, a, a test for the reader. Um, HC R naught equals, and I'll let you calculate this, but 
11.2 EVs. Now, an EV, to be clear, is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 16 joules. I don't know why I'm really questioning myself on this. Um, that doesn't look right to me, but my calculations just told me it is, so I don't know whether I should trust my calculation or my instinct. Anyway, um, test that, find out. But it's a nice easy thing to be able to write it in EVs because it turns out that this uh, write it in electron volts is a lot easier than writing it in joules.